Welcome to IMUA Quick Bites, a micro learning series featuring subject matter experts in the inland marine insurance industry. Hi, I'm Eileen Monreale, Education Training Specialist for IMUA, and I'm honored to welcome Dr. Vincent Brown. Hi, everyone. My name is Vincent Brown. Uh, it's great to be here with you today. Uh, I serve as the research director for the Southern Climate Impacts Planning Program. I'm also an assistant professor of research in the Department of Geography and Anthropology at LSU. And today for this quick bite, we're going to explore North Atlantic tropical cyclones. So to dive wide it, right into it, what is a tropical cyclone? Well, by definition, it is a warm core, which is just a fancy way of saying the center of the core of the storm is warm. Uh, synoptic sales scale cyclone, the cyclone piece implies rotation that one originates over warm tropical or subtropical waters, two exhibits organized deep convection. And by deep convection, I just mean that there's air at the surface rushing up uh, through the atmosphere, high up in the atmosphere, which is actually fueling the storm. And then third, it has a well-defined center and a closed surface circulation. I think all of these are well depicted by this image of Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, which at one point had winds over 196 miles per hour. Unfortunately, it had over 6,000 fatalities. Um, and a question we get quite frequently when talking about tropical cyclones and hurricanes is, are hurricanes tropical cyclones? And the answer is yes, all hurricanes are tropical cyclones, but not all tropical cyclones are hurricanes. We call them hurricanes once they reach a certain wind threshold as measured by the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale. Once the winds of a tropical cyclone hit 74 miles an hour or greater, it becomes a hurricane. And depending on where you are across the world, you might call a hurricane or tropical cyclone something different. For example, sometimes they're called typhoons, uh, they're called willy willies in Australia, and sometimes just cyclones. Um, and one thing I really want to uh, focus on today and talk about is it's very important to monitor wind speeds in tropical cyclones and hurricanes. And that is because the damage produced um, by hurricanes and, and tropical storms uh, increases exponentially as the wind speed increases. Uh, and it's it, the, the damage in terms of cost is what I'm talking about. A good example is if you have a hurricane moving at seven or producing winds of 75 miles per hour, and you compare that damage potential to a storm that's producing 100 winds of 150 miles per hour, the damage potential, the difference in damage and cost for the, the storm moving at 150 miles an hour, uh, the wind produced by that is 256 times greater than the storm moving at 75 miles per hour. So again, even small changes in wind speed can make a dramatic change in the potential cost or damage of the storm. Um, and it, uh, hammer that down even, even more, category three to five hurricanes, so that's storms exhibiting at least 111 miles per hour or greater. They only make up 25% of all land falling storms in the United States, uh, but cause over 85% of all the damages. So there's a disproportionate effect there of, of the number of storms that occur at that intensity and then the damage they produce. So to jump right into it, so when is hurricane season? Uh, in the North Atlantic Basin, which covers the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean, as many of you know, it is from June 1st to November 30th. That's 183 days, so roughly half of the year in the United States, we have to worry about uh, hurricanes and tropical cyclones. During this period, June 1st to November 30th, uh, roughly 97% of all activity occurs within that window, but not all activity occurs in that window. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, and that's this graphic we put together here uh, at LSU shows um, the distribution of dates of different hurricanes. So this, for example, this uh, number one here shows the date in which the first storm and all hurricane seasons formed. Uh, and by this, we can tell that the av or the median date that we get the first storm in a given hurricane season occurs on June 25th. On average, we get about 10 named storms per year. But what's interesting um, is that since 1851, uh, that's when we have data on uh, hurricanes and tropical cyclones, 38 years or roughly 22% of the seasons had a storm that formed before the official date of hurricane season, so before June 1st. And even more interesting, uh, so that sounds relatively rare, but even more interesting, seven of the last eight years, so between 2015 and 2022, have actually had a storm bef form before the official date of hurricane season. We're going to revisit this later uh, on the talk. So what are some ingredients for tropical cyclones? Why do they form where they do and, and what causes them to form? Well, they're called tropical for a reason. The tropics uh, have 
and receive more energy than anywhere else on the world. This creates an energy imbalance. The tropics receive so much solar radiation that they can't possibly re-emit it off. So there needs to be another mechanism to help imbalance that excess energy in the tropics. And that's the job of a tropical cyclone. What a tropical cyclone does is basically just redistribute energy across the planet. And there's some ingredients that need to be in place for these things to form, for hurricane and tropical cyclones to form. The first is warm sea surface temperatures. Generally, it cut off about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and it helps for the it helps tropical cyclones form if that water is at depth as well. If you have warm water at least down to 150 feet deep, you also need high humidity. You need a lot of water vapor and the low levels of the atmosphere that can be thrust upwards. That's generally what fuels uh, these storms. And then you want an unstable atmosphere with weak vertical wind shear. And wind shear is a little bit tr uh, tricky to explain, but basically what wind shear is, is as you move from the surface to the top of the atmosphere, if the wind speed increases or it changes direction, it can cause the tropical cyclone to topple or sort of be spread apart. Uh, and a good depiction of that is this leaning tower of Pisa. So imagine the arrows are wind speed. Uh, if you have wind speed increasing with height, it'll tilt the tropical cyclone over and it'll cause it to sort of not be as, the energy is less concentrated and it'll cause the storm to fall apart. See these graphics across the bottom do a good jo job of showing where these sort of ingredients uh, exist during the hurricane season, uh, as indicated by these colors. So these are showing where storms have formed uh, in June. And then you can see then in July, we get into August, it ramps up. We start getting more activity in certain areas. Uh, then September, you get into the peak of hurricane season. And then it starts waning in October and into November. I always like showing this graphic here on the x-axis is uh, days and on your y-axis is the number of storm days per day uh, and we call this the campfire graphic you can see it does a great job of highlighting when the peak uh, in the Atlantic hurricane season is which is generally right around that sort of second week in September. Tropical cyclones have preferred tracks and it varies throughout the year and it varies throughout hurricane season and what generally steers these things are wind belts think about the trade uh, easterly trade winds which exist in this sort of region here pressure systems are Bermuda high. All of these storms sort of have this bend to them. That's because the, the Bermuda high is out in the Atlantic spinning clockwise. And then also weather systems, if you have fronts and things sweeping across the region. And one question we get quite frequently is, do ocean currents uh, play a role in the tracks of tropical cyclones? And the answer is generally they do not, but they can reinvigorate or extend the life of tropical cyclones. Imagine a storm going up the East Coast, maybe it gets a ride on the Gulf Stream and it'll, that water is generally warmer in the Gulf Stream. It can take some of that energy and prolong the cyclone's life. Another question we get quite frequently is what causes variability in, in the annual number of storms we get? It's very common uh, right before hurricane season, they put out estimates of how many storms we're gonna have. And for me, I kind of narrowed it down to four major controls. First, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's very complicated to get into how this affects it, but basically when every three to seven years, uh, the sea surface temperatures in the ocean and the tropical Pacific warms up. And when it does, that warm air interacts with the atmosphere and causes downstream impacts. And when this extends into the hurricane season, uh, we generally see fewer hurricanes due to, as I was talking about, wind shear and stability in the atmosphere. So when you get El Nino warming of the tropical Pacific, that, that generally causes a big decrease in the number of storms that we get uh, during the hurricane season. Uh, the second thing, Saharan dust layer, you guys may have heard this on the news, uh, when warm, dry air blows off of Africa, it can kind of stabilize the atmosphere, it can, can act to diminish storms, genesis, and, and uh, being active in, in, the, in the Atlantic. The third, and probably one of the most important, is the sea surface temperatures out in the North Atlantic. You need these things to be running uh, warm, at least 80 degrees again, for these storms to start firing up. And then finally, an interesting um, thing is the amount of rainfall that occurs in Western Africa has actually been shown to be correlated with the number of storms that make landfall in the United States. Uh, generally, when you get a lot of rainfall in this region, it causes a lot of disturbance to come off of Africa, and those can potentially lead into more storms that, that form and come across the Atlantic. Just some interesting characteristics that I was going to uh, highlight with you. So here again is a cross section of a tropical cyclone. Um, you can see uh, moving here as you go across the tropical cyclone, the pressure drops and it's at its lowest point right in the middle of, of the cyclone. The wind speed, interesting pattern here, the right side of the tropical cyclone generally exhibits the highest wind speeds, the right front quadrant of the tropical cyclone. That's because you're you have the winds in the cyclone spinning, but also you have to factor in the the forward movement. Uh, rainfall uh, also varies within the storm. Right below these uh, convective bands and these rain bands, you tend to get a lot of rainfall, and then in between them are downdrafts uh, where there's no rainfall occurring. 
Uh, and in the center of the tropical cyclone, uh, you have air subsiding actually coming down. And, and as air sinks uh, in the atmosphere, there's more weight or more mass above it. So it, it warms. And that's why you see a clear, uh, here's the temperature, but you get a warm core that is clear of the eye you can see because the air is actually subsiding in there, uh, inhibiting rising motion so there's no clouds. And then finally, looking at storm surge again, that front right side of the tropical cyclone generally produces the highest surge uh, and it's the most deadly part of the storm. Um, and then lastly, I want to talk about hurricane size. Um, there were some some big storms like Super uh, Typhoon Tip, which was huge. We've, we have really small storms as well, like Tropical Storm Ma uh, Marco. Um, and generally, there's, so there's a wide variability, but generally, hurricanes, hurricane size storm or hurricane shrink storms, are 300 miles wide. But there is a lot of variability. Um, and the strongest storm that we had in the Atlantic was actually Wilma in 2005, which had sustained winds of over 184 miles per hour. In the Western Hemisphere, there was uh, Patricia in 2015, which had sustained winds over 213 miles per hour, which is just absurd. So moving quickly into some observed changes that we've seen in tropical cyclones, uh, starting with global mean temperatures. Obviously, everyone knows that the, the mean temperature of the planet has been going up. So has uh, tropical Atlantic sea surface temperatures where tropical cyclones form. But if you look at the trend in raw hurricane counts, you would at first say, oh, the number of hurricanes in the North Atlantic is going up. Um, but when you adjust for things like biases in our observations, um, you see that there's it's the trend is relatively flat. And that's due to the fact that we are observing tropical cyclones a lot better now than what we used to. Think about in the 1800s or, or 1850s and early 1900s or 1920s, we, um, we weren't doing a very good job of capturing hurricanes. A lot went uh, missing. Oops, uh, I, I did want to mention that there's no trend. We'll see that in a second in landfall and tropical cyclones. Um, so just talking about frequency globally, um, this black line is talking about all tropical cyclones. This red line uh, since 1970 showing trends in all hurricanes. And you can see there's really no trend on a global basis in the frequency of tropical cyclones or hurricanes. But if you look in the North Atlantic Basin, which is most important for us, there is a slight trend specifically since <clears throat> 1970. And that's related to a couple of things. One, the sea surface temperatures out there and the ocean heat content in the North Atlantic has been going up since roughly the 1970s. And also, again, we're observing these things. It's very unlikely that a, a tropical cyclone occurs in the Atlantic and we don't know about it. Um, but more importantly for us, trend in landfalling uh, hurricanes is flat. There's really nothing going on since 1851 for the number of storms that make landfall uh, in the United States. But that doesn't mean the amount of money in these disasters induced by tropical cyclones and hurricanes is going down. So what this is showing is the frequency of billion dollar tropical cyclone losses since 1980. And what you can see just since 2016, we've have 23 individual tropical cyclones that have in, induced over $1 billion in damage. And since 2016, there's been 607, an estimated $674 billion in loss specifically due to tropical cyclones in the United States. The top five most expensive storms, Katrina, Harvey, Ian, Maria, and then Sandy, which obviously hit New York. It was devastating. Again, just finishing up some observed uh, changes, lifetime maximum intensity. That's basically just looking at trends and uh, what's the greatest uh, intensity the storm reaches in its lifetime. Globally, not much is going on. But again, in the North Atlantic, we're seeing some upward trends. And again, that's likely driven uh, caused by warm sea surface temperatures uh, that we're observing in the tropical or in the North Atlantic. Sorry. Um, and then this graphic is very interesting. It's showing the date in which the first storm occurs in a given hurricane season. And this is showing the last date that a storm ends in a given hurricane season since 1970. And what you can see is that they're diverging, which tells us that hurricane season generally is getting wider. Uh, and again, since 1970, that might be related to the warming we're observing in the tropical and the North Atlantic. Storms are also globally slowing down, which has a lot of uh, uh, implications for the amount of rainfall that we're expecting from tropical cyclones. So what might happen in the future? We always get asked this. Th these are projections going out to 2055 uh, for the North Atlantic. We're, and globally, we're expecting a slight decrease in the number of storms, the frequency of total storms that uh, occur. But at the same time, intensity of the ones that do form is expected to slightly go up. But the biggest signal, the clear signal that we're seeing is the rainfall induced by tropical cyclones. We're expecting specific, specifically in the North Atlantic, a big fifth, upwards of 15% increase of the number, amount of rainfall produced by tropical cyclones. 
And again, so sort of the takeaway, what is expected to happen uh, in the North Atlantic is potentially less frequent storms, but the ones that do form uh, might be more intense, leading to more category four and five storms, which are driving an uptick in intensity. But again, a strong signal in rainfall rate. So the amount of rainfall that we're expecting to be produced by tropical cyclones. Then lastly, I just wanted to mention some work that's going on at LSU that could be pertinent for your guys' group. One project we're looking at is that how far tropical cyclones, uh, or sorry, hurricanes can penetrate in, inland. We're looking at storms that are at least 74 miles per hour. How far can they go inland, which has a lot of implications for you know, who's in the way and what is in the way and potential damage. So we're looking at what is driving certain storms to go further inland than others. And then lastly, we're looking at uh, tropical type storms and how they may stall. Stalling, this is an example of Hurricane Harvey. When storms stall, especially in the coastal region, they can produce a lot of rainfall, which can have devastating consequences. And this is just a quick graphic showing um, some stalling locations that we've been looking at in uh, the hurricane database. And you can see some interesting trends emerge. Storms tend to uh, stall down the Caribbean in October, uh, in June, potentially more along the coast. Uh, but it's an area of future research, and hopefully one day I'll be invited back back and talk about that. So with that, Thank you so much. Um, I wish I had more time to go into detail, but uh, I appreciate it. And if there's my email, if anyone has any questions, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Brown. I'm uh, really amazed at how much information you are able to fit into this time, including a lot of detail uh, and a lot of insight. So thank you so much for that. Um, as always, your presentation was very informative uh, and it's a very important topic for us. So we appreciate that. If IMUA, and we'll certainly invite you back. If IMUA members would like to learn more about tropical cyclones and other natural catastrophes and exposures, please consider any of these listed here, including U.S. hurricanes history and forecasts, which are available on demand at no cost for IMUA members. At, um, at uh, an end here, so I will say um, thank you, and we look forward to offering more quick bites and seeing you in the future. Thanks. Thank you.